Hello, my name is Cleo Kennedy. Um, I am an FY2 doctor of the Royal Free, and I'm going to be talking to you today about acute surgery or surgical issues for medics. Um, this is particularly important as a topic, I think, because although patients come into A&E or might be on the wards and they might be under a particular team or be referred to a particular team, Things aren't always that straightforward. Patients are complicated, they have comorbidities, on top of which also they might be referred to the wrong team or they might be under one team and develop another issue. Um, it's always good to be aware of the fact that someone might be referred to the wrong team um, and to know how to deal with certain issues that might come up even if it's not your specialty. Also, we all work interprofessionally um, in order to achieve optimal care for our patients and so for that reason it's particularly important. Um, and finally, particularly in recent times with the coronavirus pandemic, um, everyone is sort of pitching in and there's a lot of overlap. So actually, Recently, over the last two months, I have been on medical take and seen a fair few surgical patients because, of course, surgical teams are stretched and working intensive care. Um, and actually, a lot of the patients might come in with issues that are both surgical and medical. Um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, I'm recording this beforehand. So any questions that come up, please either email myself um, or discuss between you or email the course coordinator. Um, um, and ask. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoy it. So my plan is to just talk through a few scenarios. Um, we don't have time for a huge number of cases, but these are some that I think are particularly interesting or good to be aware of that might that might be seen. Um, some of them are more common than others. The ones that are more common um, you will inevitably see, but the ones that are less common might be more serious, um, as you'll see. And so I think they're good to be aware of. Um, if you would like more talks and more cases, I would be very, very happy to do so. Please just say. And if you have suggestions of topics, please, I would be open to that as well. Um, I would be very keen to, to cover lots of, I mean, there are tons of topics that we could cover um, and particular cases. And this is just a selection of a few. So enjoy. I won't be going into any major detail about the surgical intervention itself. I'm more looking about into what you or myself as the junior will be doing, what's expected of you, what your role is as the medic. Um, those who are interested in surgery, please feel free to, to look into all of these things further into the exact type of surgery itself and to talk to uh, specialist teams, particularly if you are shadowing them. Um, but I, in this talk, I'm looking more at what the role of the, the junior doctor is, particularly the foundation trainee, um, and also the role of the medical team in treating these patients. So we're going to start with 58-year-old Larry. You are one of the junior doctors working on the medical take or potentially within the emergency department. And Larry has come in complaining of five hours of severe, excruciating, left-sided loin pain that is continuous. It's not coming and going. He also has mild dysuria when you ask him a little bit of a history. Um, you dip his urine and it's negative for nitrites and leukocytes and shows two plus of blood. So microcytic hematuria because it's not frank. Um, in terms of past medical history, he has hypertension for which he is not taking anything. Um, he also has rheumatoid arthritis and is taking sulfasalazine. He doesn't have any drug allergies. He lives with his wife and his teenage kids, works as a taxi driver and is a smoker with a 30 pack year history. His observations are not good. They're very concerning. He is hypotensive with a blood pressure of 100 over 70. He's tachycardic. His heart rate is 125. His rest rate is 22, so he's tachypneic as well. Um, but his SATs are fine. They're 97% on room air. And he's aprexic, so no temperature at all. Um, with this particular patient with left-sided loin pain, or in fact, abdominal pain generally, um, in a man 
in this age range who has hypertension and a significant smoking history, you and signs, not just possible signs, definite signs of hemodynamic shock, you are going to be thinking about an abdominal aortic aneurysm, um, a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, and you are going to do urgent resuscitation using your A to E approach. So you are going to um, assess airway, ensure it's patent. You're going to check breathing, check the chest is clear. You're going to um, check circulation. You will make sure that you have good access um, and do aggressive fluid resuscitation. Um, you're wanting to stabilize this patient. You, There are a number of differentials, but this is the one that because of the significant risk of death and the rapid deterioration that is seen with a ruptured AAA, you need to be thinking of this as your primary differential because this is the thing that is most scary and most risky. So um, you examine the patient uh, throughout your um, ATE approach, you are examining them. You see that this patient has a large body habitus. He's lying still due to his pain, which actually in itself would rule out something like ureteric colic, which often comes and goes. Um, and the patient is often writhing around. Um, and you find that there is a pulsatile expansile mass just above the umbilicus. So this is confirming what you're already worried about, which is a ruptured AAA. Um, so as I said, urgent resuscitation, but also alert the surgical team, the vascular surgery team, as soon as possible. Um, you'd also alert your own seniors and whatever the resuscitation peri-arrest team is within your hospital, you want people to know that this patient is one that you are very, very concerned about. This is a surgical emergency. Um, so the patient's going to be taken to theatre, but you want to make them as stable as possible. Um, so as I said, aggressive fluid resuscitation, you are going to get two wide bore grey cannulas in, in each antecubital fossa. Or in fact, to be honest, as a junior doctor, you're going to get those wide bore cannulas in anywhere you can. Um, unfortunately, the patient is likely to be quite shut down. Um, so you are going to get access whatever way you can. And if need be, you may have to get other teams to help you with this. Um, you're going to do bloods, you're going to cross match um, four to six units. Um, you are going to you could consider the gold standard of imaging, which is CT with contrast. Um, or even because you're in the emergency department, you might want to consider, say, for example, a fast scan, which is a focused abdominal sonographic um, imaging for trauma um, or an abdominal ultrasound. This will help the surgical team, the vascular surgery team with um, defining exactly where the AAA is um, and the extent of how bad it is. Um, I've written here consent for theatre if they're conscious, if you're able, but of course that wouldn't be your job as the junior. Um, it would be the surgical team who know exactly what the procedure is that they're consenting for. Um, so, of course, abdominal pain, um, it is not that frequent that you will see someone who comes in with abdominal pain and they are having um, something of this severity. Often it's something quite mundane like ureteric colic, which can be excruciatingly painful and patients often writhe around in pain all over the floor. Um, and for this, you might get a CTKUB. You might have diverticulitis. You might have pyelonephritis where you get pain on blotting. There are a number of things. You could have a, a appendicitis, which can cause um, abdominal pain. But in this particular patient, in this age range, with these risk factors, you want to be thinking about what is the worst thing that could be happening, because that's the thing you need to treat first and foremost. Um, so moving on to our next case, it's been a dramatic shift so far. So on to case number two, we have 48 year old Mary. She has come in with a big nosebleed. So let's say it's later on in the same shift. Uh, you are still the junior doctor. You are still based in the emergency department. Um, now, I know 
nosebleeds are common. Uh, they happen all the time. Probably every single person listening to this talk has had a nosebleed. But for most of us, they're mild, um, usually caused by minor trauma. Um, but they should always be taken seriously. A big nosebleed can be the cause of mortality. Um, and for that reason, they do need to be taken very, very seriously. So Mary comes in and she's had uh, profuse blood loss over the last 20 minutes um, from her left nostril. It hasn't stopped despite pressure over the area. She reports that it started spontaneously and that now she's starting to feel a bit woozy. She's never had anything like this before. In terms of a past medical history, she is on warfarin for atrial fibrillation um, and is having this monitored and has her yellow book with her. And she's also perimenopausal. She reports that she's seeing her GP, um, being monitored for this. Uh, she has night sweats and so on, but is not on any HRT at present. She has no drug allergies. She lives at home with her wife and two children, and she's a teacher. So, in terms of her observation, she's tachycardic. Um, she's got a heart rate of 120. Her respiratory rate is 20. Her blood pressure is very low, 90 over 60. And her saturations are fine. She's apyrexic. So on examination, you find that she has cool peripheries. Her capillary refill is four seconds, which um, is certainly delayed. And she appears pale. She has fresh red blood coming from the left nostril. Uh, she's holding a soaked handkerchief and the top of her, the front of her top is also covered in blood. You also notice whilst examining her that she has some large bruising noted around the body and on the limbs. So the main priority is to stabilize her and then to aim to stop the bleeding. Um, she's in shock. So if she weren't in shock, we might treat slightly differently, but either way we're contacting ENT urgently, um, establishing venous access and getting doing aggressive fluid resus for this patient. Also, because she is bleeding from her nose, you want to consider her airway. Um, you might position her in such a way as to ensure that the blood isn't going down the back of her throat. Um, and also potentially think about contacting anaesthetists early um, in order to secure the airway. So blood should include clotting, consider that she's on warfarin, and also a group and save. You also want to be doing firm pressure over the cartilaginous section of the nose. Um, her head should be forward and down. This is so that the blood doesn't run posteriorly. posteriorly. And you also could consider putting ice on her forehead at the tip of her nose, sort of the sort of kind of brow area, um, as this will aid coagulation. If possible, you should try and estimate the blood loss, um, although of course this is hard, uh, hard to do because it's a really vascular area, she's been bleeding before she's come in, but if you can have a kind of rough idea of how much blood she's lost, that's always useful, particularly as ENT will probably want to know. After about 10 to 15 minutes of putting firm pressure over the cartilaginous section of the nose with the head forward and down, um, you might consider packing. If the packing is going to remain in for over 48 hours, you also want to be considering prophylactic antibiotics. Um, and also, if there's any packing, you need to be admitting this patient. There is a risk of inhaling the packing and hypoxia, and this patient needs monitoring. Um, even if the blood stops, if the bleeding stops. So with packing, you could consider using something like simple sterile gauze, um, or there are specialist bismuth, iodine, paraffin preparation pastes, but you'd want to ask ENT for advice about this. Um, so you get her blood back. Um, so ENT are the specialists when it comes to the packing. Don't worry too much about that. Your role as the medic is to consider what the cause is. Um, so as I mentioned before, we've all had bleeds from the nose, simple trauma, um, 
is the most common cause of nosebleed, but usually that these aren't quite as profuse. Um, you also might want to consider uh, the pathological causes, such as things like medications. This patient is on warfarin. Um, also, because it's unilateral, you might consider whether there's any kind of um, malformation to the blood vessels or neoplasms, uh, whether she has any underlying liver disease that could impair her coagulation. Um, so, INR comes back and it's four. You, as the medic, are thinking immediately about what you need to do to reduce her risk of continuous bleeding. So stopping warfarin, giving vitamin K. Um, discussing with hematology is incredibly important uh, because you might want to consider giving fresh, fresh frozen plasma or prothrombin complex, but you would want hematology advice and input on this. Um, ENT, you're probably going to get involved and the gold standard for them is doing these endoscopy and treating the area directly. If it's a localized area, they may use silver nitrate, um, they may use cautery, but do not worry about that. That's not your role as the junior. Um, I'd also discuss with my own seniors. With all of these cases, discussing with your own seniors is imperative. Um, and alerting seniors early and involving different teams is important. So that's case number two. Tonight you have, or today in this shift, you've already treated two very serious surgical patients, um, both of whom have been shocked. So well done, team. On to the next one. Oh, uh, just before moving on to the next case, um, I did mention that you might treat slightly differently if you thought that they were shocked versus not shocked. Um, the main difference in doing this would be that whilst putting firm pressure over the cartilaginous section of nose, um, if they were not shocked and you weren't worried about that, um, you could have them sitting up. Um, whereas if they were shocked, you're more likely to have them lying. Um, also worth noting, um, which would inevitably come up whilst you're discussing with haematology, is why she's taking warfarin. Um, this should be available as information within her yellow book. Um, she also hopefully will know when you take a thorough history. Um, if she's got a mechanical valve, for example, uh, this particular woman, she's taking it for AF um, because that will determine uh, number one, if you're going to stop the warfarin straight away, just like that, um, and also whether you're going to consider or whoever's looking after her during her inpatient admission, um, whether we would alter her anticoagulation um, and then look into how we're going to kind of go forward once she's discharged, because of course, if she has AF or a mechanical valve or whatever the indication is for her having it, she's going to need to be anticoagulated long term. And so looking into the most appropriate way of doing this um, is another role of the medical team. So moving on. In comes Frank. Now, Frank is 75 and he's come in because he's spiking temperatures. His temperature at present is 38.7 and he's tachycardic. His heart rate is up to 118. Um, he has quite a complicated history. He has benign prostatic hypertrophy and came in eight months ago because he was in urinary retention. At that point, he was admitted for a little bit under the urology team. He was given some tamsulosin and had a catheter inserted and went home. He was booked for a TWOC clinic. TWOC is the trial without catheter. Unfortunately, this failed. And again, it failed. And again. So he has had four failed TWOCs and has had a catheter inserted now, long term catheter for eight months. And as a result, he's had recurrent UTIs in this time. He saw his GP a few days ago because he was having these temperatures, who decided to start him on oral co-moxiclav. But unfortunately, he is not getting better. He is, in fact, getting worse. He lives with his wife. He is baseline independent of all activities of daily living. He recently retired as an accountant. He's a non-smoker, has the occasional glass of wine. Otherwise, no major health, health issues. Um, he's not really enjoying having this catheter in, in long term. Um, 
as it's distressing him and he doesn't like having it tied to his leg. It's quite uncomfortable um, and he doesn't like the recurrent UTIs. But otherwise, his baseline is pretty, pretty good. So first and foremost, you think that Frank is presenting with urosepsis. Um, first thing you want to do is you want to think about your sepsis six. So three out, three in. Um, you want to be taking blood cultures. Um, we think he's got urosepsis, but we should be also culturing his blood as well. Um, you want to be doing a VBG or an ABG to check his lactate, which would be raised. Um, on top of that, he has a catheter in. You want to be measuring his urine output. In fact, you want a very good fluid balance chart going. Um, in terms of in, you want to be giving IV fluid. You want to be giving high flow oxygen. Um, he and you want to be giving antibiotics. Now, these will most likely be guided by your trust protocol or trust guidelines. Um, in my trust, our first line is gentamicin. Um, also with Frank, just to note, you would want to be giving paracetamol unless there was some kind of contraindication because this would help in bringing down his temperature along with the fluid. Um, so as I said, in my trust, giving gentamicin is the first line treatment in terms of antibiotics. Um, so I I found giving gentamicin quite stressful the first few times I did it because, of course, there are certain calculations to do. Um, you want to know what the patient's renal function is because this will guide how often you give it. Um, you also want a gent level to be done six to 14 hours after they've received their dose um, to make sure that nothing dangerous has happened and this will guide your next dose after that. Um, you also need to know their weight in order to give the correct dosing. Um, all of this should be available. Um, there should be on your trust guidelines and protocols. There should be information on how to give gentamicin. And actually, it's really thorough. And if you can't find it on kind of your intranet, then ask the pharmacists for advice. That's always useful. Or in fact, just look online. There are plenty of guidelines out there that can help you. Um, of course, I you might not give gentamicin. There are second line drugs as well. Um, in my own trust, I believe it's ciprofloxacin. Um, that might vary. Um, these are the empiric treatments. Of course, you would be taking a sample of urine, dipping it, um, and then sending it off for culture. And in about 48 hours, you'd hope that you would have some information back on sensitivities that would guide antibiotic choice. Um, Nevertheless, uh, so you'd give your stat dose of gentamicin. Um, and as I mentioned with the, uh, you would want to be culturing the urine. I said you'd culture the blood. You basically want to be doing a full septic screen. So doing this would involve also looking for any wounds that might be infected, um, any other source of infection, whether the chest is clear, um, you could do a chest x-ray as well. Um, if there was a cough with any sputum being brought up that you could send for culture, any other lines, anything at all that could be a source of infection. Now with Frank, it's pretty clear cut, um, but just because something looks obvious, don't forget to look into the other potential options and risks that could, other issues that could be happening as well. Um, because that is part of the joy of, of being a medic is that patients don't exist in a vacuum and diseases don't exist in a vacuum. And actually you need to be considering other things that could be going on as well, even if they might be quite rare. Um, something to note that Frank has had a long term indwelling catheter for a really long time. A lot of patients who have long, long term indwelling catheters might have some candida. Uh, around their groin and genitals. Um, and so in order to be thorough, this probably wouldn't be causing their full full blown sepsis, but it is worth treating this as well, um, particularly as it can be incredibly uncomfortable for patients. So once Frank is stable, um, 
with all of the patients that you're seeing when you treat as you all know i'm sure really well because you probably get told it all the time you go back and you just reassess so you want a fresh set of obs and now his heart rates come down to 100 his rest rates 18 his blood pressure is 140 over 90 his temperatures come down to 37.8, so that paracetamol is helping, so the IV fluids, and his stats are 96% on one litre. He's getting a via a nasal cannula. So um, you'd want to do a full examination. As I mentioned, you want to be assessing whether there could potentially be another source of infection um, and listening to his chest and so on assessing his abdomen, feeling for his bladder to see if it's enlarged and looking at the catheter bag to see if there's any clots in it, um, if there's anything that could potentially be blocking it draining properly, um, whether he's tender at all in his abdomen. So on examining him, you find that the contents of the catheter bag are malodorous and there's some sediment noted, but it does appear to be draining um, and he doesn't have an enlarged bladder at all on palpation of the abdomen. Um, PR exams are very important. I would say that for any patient who is in the elderly age range who's coming in, particularly if they're confused, you'd want to um, check to see if they have um, and in anything going on. Um, so PR exams generally are quite important because with elderly patients, you might be considering things like constipation. Uh, PR exam with this man, you're particularly looking for his prostate. You want to know, is it smooth or is it craggy? Is it big? How big? It's quite hard to estimate. Um, I would say that it's always worth early on in your career uh, discussing with someone else who's maybe doing a PR exam because you can compare whether the size that and shape and so on that you're feeling is similar to what they're feeling to know whether you're getting the right impression from what you're examining. Um, so he has a smooth and enlarged prostate. Um, you think it's around 60 cubic centimetres. Um, a transurethral ultrasound will give you more information about whether this is in fact correct. Um, so he has one and a little bit smaller on the transurethral ultrasound, 43 cubic centimetres. Um, these are or tend to be more um, informative than, for example, doing a uh, transabdominal ultrasound. You get a better view. Um, so he's going to have surgical intervention. Um, for his enlarged prostate because clearly the tangulosin is not doing the job, um, unfortunately. So he could have a transurethral resection of the prostate or a HOLEP. Now, a HOLEP is a laser, laser, I can't speak, laser procedure um, where it's uh, the, the prostate um is i think it stands for a nucleation so it's a it's a type of procedure where a um a laser is used to remove the uh enlarged tissue and so create a bigger lumen for urine to traverse the urethra um and so there's not as much of a blockage there um this you don't need to worry about. The urologists will be in charge of doing this um, and they will decide on what the procedure is and get him prepared for it. Um, your role is to treat his sepsis. Um, this is his acute issue. It's why he's come in and right there and then he's going to need that treated first and foremost. Um, the surgical interventions the, to treat his chronic issue. Um, the other thing that you might do uh, on admission, you check his bloods and then long term, whilst he was an inpatient, if you were one of the ward doctors, you would be wanting to look into his renal function. Um, he's had long term urological issues and, of course, these systems inter interlink and overlap and having recurrent UTIs, urinary tract infections, having had BPH, um, having had urinary retention, you want to know whether potentially he has hydronephrosis, whether his kidneys are functioning um, at 
as well as they should. Um, so these are all really important things to look into longer term um, once you've stabilised him. So onwards. It's been a long shift so far and now you've been called to see Gladys. Gladys is 82 and she's come in because she's had a fall. She doesn't really recall the events preceding the fall. She doesn't remember if she lost consciousness or how long she was on the floor. She was found by her daughter. Her daughter lives nearby and was coming over to double check on her, uh, as she does frequently, and found her lying on the floor and called the Lum London Ambulance Service. When she found her, she was alert and awake. Gladys lives alone. She doesn't have any carers but she does have family nearby. She isn't working anymore, um, but she does volunteer at her local community centre um, and is an active member of the community. Her baseline mobility is good. She's independent. She cooks, she cleans, she does all of that stuff, and she does not need any walking aids. Um, in terms of past medical history, she had a heart attack in 2016 and had two stents put in. She has high blood pressure. She has osteoarthritis and takes just some over-the-counter analgesia for that. Um, in terms of her medication, she's on atorvastatin. She's on clopidogrel. She's on amlodipine. And she has, as I said, some analgesia in the form of ibuprofen and paracetamol, PRN, as required. Um, and she has no drug allergies. So, so, poor old Gladys. She has a blood pressure of 143 over 70. Her heart rate's 90, breast rate 16, 98% on Romare. And she has no temperature. Her temperature is 36.7, so no increased temperature. Um, in terms of her examination, she's alert. She's not drowsy, no confusion. Her AMTS is 10 out of 10. She is totally oriented to time, place, person. Um, heart sounds 1 and 2 present, no added sounds. Chest is clear, abdomen is soft and non-tender. Bowel sounds present. On a PR exam, which is something that's well worth doing if you're clerking patients in the emergency department, particularly old patients or those who have some kind of indication, like our previous man, you know, some hemorrhoids, but nothing else that's particularly exciting. When you examine her hip, her left hip is shortened and externally rotated and she has pain at rest. It's worse on passive movement and she has a limited range of movement generally. Her calves are equal in size, they aren't swollen or hot, and she has no edema. No sensory deficits noted, um, and she has no evidence of neurological damage. Her pupils are equal and reactive to light, cranial nerves are intact, and peripheral sensation is fine. No suggestion to, of disruption to her vasculature on the left leg. Um, and on imaging, we can see here that she does indeed have an intertrochanteric fracture of the left femur. So we think that she's got a neck and femur fracture. Now, of course, the main management, again, like all of these patients, is surgical once she's hemodynamically stable. Um, so you could help with preparing her for theatre, you do her bloods, you do all of that stuff, you can make a nil by mouth, you alert the theatre team um, or the surgical team who can then alert the theatre team. Um, you're not worried about her airway, so you don't need to worry about alerting anaesthetists in terms of thinking about intubation or anything like that. But, I mean, if you want to do the surgical team a favour, you could tell the, the surgical, um, tell the anaesthetist that she's there. Um, but really, you're just letting the, the trauma and orthopedic team know that she's present in the, in the department and that she probably will need to go for surgery. She definitely will need to go for surgery. Um, so, but your role, because you're the medical junior, is more broad. So she's come in, she's an elderly woman, and you want to know why she's fallen. Um, a thorough history from her will hopefully help with this, so you want to know pre-fall, what was going on, what was she doing, was she outside, was she inside, had she eaten much that morning, um, did she feel woozy at all beforehand, um, you want to know about the fall itself, 
point did she fall from a height? Did she go down the stairs? Was she in the bathroom? And also post-fall. I know she hasn't given a particularly good history in terms of being able to tell you how long she was on the floor. Did she lose consciousness? But you always want to be asking these things. A collateral history is always good, particularly if someone might have seen the fall itself. Um, unfortunately, her daughter was not able to tell us anything in this particular case. Um, you also want to be considering what else is going on. So what could have caused this fall? Is she, does she have uneven flooring? Does she wear shoes that don't fit her very well? Is she on multiple medications that might be interacting with one another? She, could she have had a syncope, syncope uh, kind of fainting episode? Could she have had a cardiac event? She's had a heart attack in the past or even a stroke. Um, is she eating and drinking properly? Is she taking good care of herself at home? You might consider whether she's dehydrated. Um, it's coming into the summer now. We're going to get more and more patients with deranged electrolytes who haven't been taking care of themselves at home, haven't eaten and drunk enough, and then end up coming in because they've lost consciousness. Um, also, whether she's got any underlying infections. So, for example... Our previous gentleman who had uh, urosepsis you might want to consider in an elderly lady whether she has a UTI uh, or a chest infection that could have premeditated her having a fall. These are all things that you want to be considering. Good history should help. Full bloods, um, getting some imaging. So we've got imaging of her hip here, but you might also want to consider getting a chest x-ray. Um, also, you want to think has the fall caused any damage? So you might want to consider um, doing a CT of her head, particularly if she has any wounds on her head, uh, if there's any confusion. She's not confused, but other patients in this position might be. Um, and if she's on any kind of anticoagulation, you would be considering doing that. Um, so you also might want to consider risk factors for her fracture itself. So whether she has osteoporosis, um, the, or osteomalacia that might need to be treated. Um, different circumstances, you might also consider whether there's any osteomyelitis, um, not for this particular patient, but potentially for known vascular patients, that's often an issue. You might consider whether she has bony mets that make her bones more fragile, or pagets. Um, these are all things that need to be considered, and the medical team are in a prime position to do that. If you're clerking and admitting this person, you can order a lot of tests that might guide um, her care during her admission. Um, and these things will also help for reducing her risk for the future. So considering, is she coping well at home? Does she need carers? Uh, this is an elderly woman who, from all accounts sounds to be very independent, but whether this particular admission, her fall and hip fracture, um, might impact upon that, or also whether she's not coping at home and needs carers, and that's part of the reason why she's ended up in this position in the first place. Um, you might sit with pharmacists and do a medication review. Um, this is not something you do on her admission necessarily, but while she's an inpatient, you would probably think about whether, particularly if she's on multiple medications that could be interacting with one another, whether these are things that you might want to um, review, limit the number of medications she's on. Polypharmacy can often be a big issue. Um, so you're addressing any underlying and associated issues and risk factors. So those are four cases, um, all quite different, all different surgical teams um, that you might encounter whilst doing medical jobs, um, particularly if you're on the medical take or if you're in the emergency department working there. Um, so... So uh, that's me done. Thank you very, very much for listening. Um, I should add at this point, I am by no means an expert. Um, I'm an F2 who has really enjoyed all of my jobs that I've done so far. Um, and these are things that actually, as a junior, you end up overlapping teams in a way that you don't once you specialise. And so that gives us a really unique position to see how we might actually end up seeing surgical issues on the medical jobs or even 
we often end up looking after a lot of medical issues on surgical jobs um, because of course these things aren't clean cut there's a big gray area um, so what I would say is enjoy it as I said I'm not the expert so please go away and discuss amongst yourselves and read more around each topic um, and thank you again uh, feel free to contact me with any questions I can't promise I'll be able to answer them but I will do my best Thanks, bye.